Hello, Chen. My name is Vince Graham, and I'm with the Ion Group in Mount Pleasant. A month or so ago, I called Bupa Pritchard to express interest in purchasing the roughly eight-acre site owned by members of his and the Morrison family at the foot of the Ben Sawyer Boulevard Causeway. Bupa arranged a meeting with Haygood, which was followed by another meeting which included his sister, Louisa Hawkins. With slight variation, this video is the presentation given to Louisa, Bupa, and Haygood. I'm working with Daryl and John Ferguson on other projects along Coleman and Ben Sawyer Boulevards, and the purpose of this presentation was to show our vision for the site and an approach to how we might go about purchasing the property from the families. Here's the site shown in the lower right hand corner of the screen. Above is Ion, my company's flagship neighborhood, which includes 762 homes, commercial space, and civic uses like clubhouses, a church, and school. It's built on 244 acres. For perspective, shown in yellow is Broad Street on the peninsula downtown, and overlaying an outline of Ion shows that this neighborhood is roughly the size of the area south of Broad Street. Our timing for developing Ion was fortunate, and I don't know if it would have been possible to undertake such a large project in today's economic climate. For the foreseeable future, I believe we'll see smaller infill developments like Moore Square. This was a one-acre vacant site my company purchased from the synagogue for the development of 32 homes and 2,500 square feet of commercial space. The one-acre Moore Square site also includes two small City Park. We're currently working on Earl's Court at the corner of Hibben and Wilden Street in the Old Village. This will be what I think of as an Old Village version of Moore Square. It won't be quite as dense and the homes will be smaller and less formal than those built downtown, but the principle is the same. The town of Mount Pleasant adopted a comprehensive plan in 2009. I've included several pages of this document. Feel welcome to pause the video to read them. Among the strategies the town is targeting is to enhance waterfront access promote infill development, and create waterfront gateways for the town. There's further deep about these strategies in the plan, which you can pull up on the town's website. Among the ideas expressed in the plan is one to create gateway districts, such as the Ravenel Bridge, Highway 41 as it crosses the Wando River, and at the Isle of Palms Connect. However, the plan overlooks another gateway opportunity at the foot of the causeway. We all know how well located the site is, 3.5 miles from the Ravenel Bridge, and an easy 2 miles from the beach. The site has 620 feet of frontage along Ben Sawyer Boulevard and 820 feet along the marsh. With regard to the vision for the site, I'll speak first about the public realm, which is planner jargon for the common. As described by the town's comp plan, our vision involves enhancing the arrival experience as one approaches Mount Pleasant from Sullivan's Island with design and landscape features. So rather than driving across beautiful marsh and into a nondescript landscape, we'd like one to feel ceremoniously welcomed into town. This would be similar to the feeling one gets when they come into a lot of old towns, like Sconset, a little town shown here on Nantucket Island in Ma Massachusetts. We aim a similar feeling at Ion. No grand entrance, but there is a roundabout, which in addition to providing a memorable arrival experience, so serves to calm traffic speed. Taking this idea to Ben Sawyer, imagine roundabouts at the foot of the causeway and at Center Street, creating a quarter-mile slow-speed section of Ben Sawyer. Another thought would be to redesign this section as a multi-way boulevard. There's a large version of this idea in Paris. It enables new traffic, middle lanes, slower moving traffic, and parking on the flanking lane. The planner's image is shown here. See again, center lanes are for through traffic, flanking lanes for slower moving local traffic and parking. These road types are increasingly being used in other parts of the country to replace four and five lane strip roads in an effort to create a more urban sense of place. Here's a dramatic example showing how an elevated expressway through downtown San Francisco is replaced with Octavia Boulevard. Then you see through traffic lanes in the middle, flanking lanes which accommodate local traffic and parking. Here's a smaller version of the idea implemented in Alice Beach, a town on the Florida Panhandle. In this case, you have two rather than four lanes through the middle, flanking lanes on either side. Some other shots of this public thoroughfare through Alice Beach. The design calms traffic speed, creating a beautiful pedestrian-friendly setting that creates a sense of place and adds value to the adjacent private homes and businesses. Applying the same idea to Ben Sawyer Boulevard, here are the two imagined roundabouts. A section of road would then be put on a diet, reducing it to two lanes with a flanking way road that would accommodate local traffic and parking. Live oaks and palmettos could be planted to enhance the arrival experience. Out to the waterfront. Perspective. 
consider Murray Boulevard adjacent to White Point Garden between King and East Battery, a distance of 910 feet. Now around the corner, East Battery between South Battery and Water Street is about 950 feet. Your property has approximately 820 feet of frontage. So back to the envisioned boulevard, perhaps there's an opportunity to create a Mount Pleasant version of the battery where homes and businesses would overlook a public promenade. It's also worth pointing out that deep water access exists 625 feet from your shoreline, which is within the 1,000 foot maximum for a private dock. This would create the opportunity to build an architecturally significant pierhead like the ones my company built at New Point in Beaufort and on Hopkall Creek at Ion. Now I'd like to talk about the public realm for the interior of site, and to do that I'll use an example of Grace Lane and Ion. Planners sometimes talk of a street as an outdoor room, and the way this analogy works, the pavement, sidewalks, and grass are the floor of this room. Then the sides of the buildings and the fronts are the walls, and trees are planted along the street that ultimately grow up and form a canopy, which is the ceiling of this room. So again, you have the floor in the form of the paving and the grass, the walls on either side, and the trees which grow up and form a canopy, and that's a ceiling. And the idea here is you work to enclose the space, the natural and man-made features, to make it feel comfortable and complement the private buildings. So within ION, we have several different types of outdoor room. This is a 22-foot street and a 50-foot right-of-way. This is a 20-foot street and a 30-foot right-of-way. And this is our largest street, a 30-foot street and a 50-foot right-of-way. And it's gratifying to see that after 10 years since the trees were planted, they're growing up and forming a canopy and, and thus the ceiling of this outdoor room. Another thing that's important about the design of the public realm is calming traffic speed. I took this picture in the old point of Beaufort a few years ago, and it's a uh, dog sleeping in the street. And we all always tell the planners working for me that if you can design a street so that a dog will feel comfortable sleeping in it, you've succeeded. We've been looking at and researching other streets around the country that have this small, intimate feel, like these streets in Martha's Vineyard and uh, this one on Sullivan's Island. Here's Pirate's Cruise in the Old Village and a couple of streets we built at New Point and Beaufort. Mises Lane shown here and Bucks Lane here. Just introducing a little levity, this, was, this is a few slides we used when we were going for approval at the Planning Commission for Earl's Court. This is my dog laying down. He's about four feet long, as you can see by the measuring tape here. And here he is on uh, Morrison Street, one of my favorite streets in the Old Village, probably named of, for an uh, ancestor of the Morrison family. So you have Earl, he's four feet, and Morrison Lane is 16 feet wide, or four Earls. And um, with this, we gained approval. Now, for the sake of discussing the market and opportunities, I want to first mention several 21st century realities. As of the last census, 2010 census, married couples with children under 18 living at home constitute less than 22% of all households. And married couples with children under 18 in which one of the, only one of the parents works comprises less than 15% of all U.S. households. The fact of the matter is, is that 60% of all U.S. households contain just one or two people. So why are we building all these big giant houses if most of our households are only one or two people? In 1950, the average new home was 983 square feet. And that had gotten to 1,500 square feet by 1970. 30 years later, it had grown to 2,200 feet. And as of the last census, the average new home was 2,400 square feet. Now look at this. In 1950, the uh, average household size was 3.37 persons, and it's ranked to 3.14 persons per household in 70, 2.62 in 2000, and 2.59 in 2010. So that the uh, in 2010, the average square feet per person in a new house was almost the size of a whole house in 1950. It appears to have peaked in 2,500 and dropped. I expect it will continue to drop over the course of the next few years. I've seen a lot of articles like this that talk about consumer preferences shifting to smaller houses and condominiums. It makes the point that while a lot of people still want a large, big suburban house, many people don't. 
and this particular analyst says that we're out of balance in terms of where the market is and suggests that there's a need for 10 million more attached and 30 million more small houses. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and make another point about what technology has done for us in terms of building smaller and higher performing products. This was uh, a picture from 1954 and it was the Rand Corporation's vision of what a home computer would look like by the year 2004. And then of course the reality of what a home computer looked like in 2004. Now some may not recognize this but it's a record player and people used to have these big collections of albums. That was where their music Music was and of course today we have our little iPod that store all the music. We used to carry around these brick, big brick phones and of course over the years the phones have, have shrunk into something that just fits in your hand. Now my point here is that uh, technology has, has uh, shrunk devices and given us higher or, or more productive tools. So why couldn't the same be done with houses? And I've, I've drawn my interest in sailing and boat design here. I'm, I've always been interested in, in how the intimate details of boat interiors and thinking how you might accommodate those and, and implement those in houses. And I'll get back to that in a minute, but here are some examples of smaller houses in Ion. These were built in the first phase of Ion. This shows the first two houses. This, this was the second house built right here. It's uh, 1,200 square feet, two bedroom, two and a half bath, built over a raised basement, which includes a 600 square foot apartment. And the interior of this house is 20 feet wide by 30 feet deep. Some other small houses. This one on the right sold recently. It was built in 1998, but sold in 2007 for $425,000. Here's one I built for myself, which sold in 2007 for $519,000. The subject of a traditional home article. Um, it's small, but it has high quality details and almost boat-like in its character. We've used these ideas again at Moore Square with smaller homes and at Mixon. And we've also used it at Ion. Um, this is an area of the neighborhood at Sanibel and Joggling Street. And we had sold most of the property in this area. We did have a couple of lots that were unsold, zoomed in on 663. This was a lot that uh, we still had, and back in the day it would have sold for probably $225,000. It's a 40 by 120 foot lot. Then in the real estate downturn, we kept having to drop the price to 200 and 190 and 180 and 160. Finally, we just decided to take it off the market, and we thought that we might do better if we subdivided it. Is what we did, creating two lots, 663A and 663B, which we sold, and we sold each one for about $110,000, which provided the opportunity to build smaller houses. And this was the one built on 663B, and then the other one on 663A. 1,100 square feet was the former, and this one is 1,200 square feet. Here you see them together. We thought, well, actually, you know, they have pretty good sized yards, so looking at it from overhead, we, saw, we looked at this and said, next time we do this, why don't we get even more efficient? Not everybody want, likes to cut grass or maintain a yard. We took the same kind of thinking across the street to 632. And instead of two lots, we subdivided that into three. And we built this one and sold it last year for 379000 Small front-loaded driveway with a little patio. And this house is actually being built at 1,643 square feet. It sold before it started construction for 412000 And then the final lot construction has just started. And if you're interested in buying it, call William Mean. So we're planning to use these same ideas at Earl's Court. As I mentioned, these will be the first four houses built at Earl's Court. I also want to mention that part of our vision involves commercial space, which would include an understatedly elegant restaurant, the kind of place where you would, wouldn't be out of place with a blazer on downstairs, and we'd have a bar upstairs where you could go and, and have a drink and look over the marsh, catch the sunset. The uh, Fergusons, by the way, are investors in many fine restaurants downtown, including Oku, Oak Steakhouse on Broad Street, and more recently the Macintosh, which is getting all kind of rave reviews and has a wonderful chef there, Jeremiah Bacon, who's one of the finalists for the James Beard Awards this year.
So finally, I want to talk a little bit about how we might go about purchasing the property from the families. We would do what's called a rolling up, where we took down a first phase, a track A, in year one, and take down subsequent parcels over the next four years. So track to B, a couple of acres, and also track C, two acres, and finally track D. Next steps. The family would need to discuss this, see if they're interested in pursuing this venture with us, and if you'd like to sell the property. We'd like to work with you to determine a fair market value, negotiate a purchase and sale agreement, approach the town of Mount Pleasant about the idea for creating a gateway, and create a development plan. I greatly appreciate your watching, and if you have any questions at all, please feel welcome to contact me. My email address is vince, V-I-N-C-E, at iongroup.com can call me at 971-1662. So I look forward to continuing the discussion. Thanks for watching.